uh, uh, no, a side note. I'm not formally trained in computer science, so there are things that if you have uh, taken compiler classes in co uh, computer science uh, that I might be missing. So please come talk to me after and like share knowledge. It's great. It's a really fun thing. But anyway, I'm Chris. Uh, I work for Walmart Labs in Portland, Oregon. I'm originally from Wichita, Kansas, just north of here. So it's, it's great that this is going on uh, in the area. I, I love it. Um, and today I'd like to talk to you about how we think about our code. Um, and to start with, I kind of want to broach the, the, the question of what is a program? Like, what do we mean when we say uh, program? Is it the text we write? Is it what runs on the CPU? Or is it what's running in our head as we're writing the program? And what differentiates one program from another program? What kind of definitions can we come up with there? And so this is going to take us through um, a process called parsing, tokenization, real quick. Um, I touched on this uh, at my talk uh, uh, building on um, from last year at Cascadia 2013 um, that was exploring what we can do with abstract syntax trees. So first of all, we've got a program. It's just text. It's bytes. Um, it's pretty simple. It's a comparison function. Sees if left-hand side is bigger than right-hand side. But there's treachery afoot. We can actually make a truer representation of this, a, a derivation, by turning into a stream of tokens, discarding spaces, building a tree out of it that represents the structure of the program. Mm -hmm. And we start to lose information, like those braces and parentheses and spaces, comments. We end up with something like this, and then AST. And it's got one really important property that's really germane to uh, what is a program. And that is, one syntax tree can represent multiple different input texts. For example, if we take the original syntax tree uh, and we change the uh, letters or the, the names of everything uh, reliably, we end up with the same program, yes? I mean, it kind of follows that if you minify your program, it's still the same program, it's just got different text. So we're looking for uh, tools that let us build on that and let us say different things about our code because we can uh, take different views of the abstractions. We can say different programs are the same because they've got uh, the same abstract syntax tree structure. Or we can say that they're the same because they have the same control flow graph structure. And so what is a control flow graph? Control flow graphs represent the flow between operations in a program, the, the transfer of control from one operation to another. They are directed graphs, so they're like Git. But importantly, one major distinction from Git is that they're, uh, they can contain cycles. Whereas Git is acyclic, the directed graphs, uh, control flow graphs are, you know, by definition, contain cycles. They, go, uh, they have edges that go from one node to another, and those nodes represent operations, something that the program is doing. And the edge represents a possible exit case. So we go back to our AST, and we've got little IDs slotted in there. And we're just going to pay attention to the return part of it. We're not going to touch functions yet. And so if we take that, and we just kind of look at it individually, spread it out, um, we're left with uh, the stitching process of creating a control flow graph. You stitch from the first thing you would visit in the program to the next, to the next, to the next. And sort of uh, any control flow graph building library is an operation of uh, applying the control flow graph generation function to each node in order of when it would be visited in the program. So you end up with control flow graph operation nodes at each AST node, and then edges between them. So you can see this operation is loading an identifier. The next operation is also loading an identifier, and we can transfer control over to a subtraction. And what's interesting about this is that our nested structure is now another flat structure. It's actually like, I mean, it doesn't look flat right now, but it's got that zigzag. But that line is flat. It's an order of operations. And the really neat thing about control flow graphs, I think, one of the very, very many neat things, is that it can represent multiple different syntax trees. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Uh, you can represent the same loop multiple different ways in the language. You can use a while loop, a for loop. And to illustrate that, 
So this is a while x is greater than 3, you subtract 2 from x and keep going. This uh, on the right is the usual like way we display a control flow graph, just blocks. So block 1 goes to block 2 if that test condition is true, and that test condition is part of block 1. If block two, when block 2 executes, it automatically transfers control black back to black one, or <laughs> block 1. Oops, can't say, speak. Uh, and then once it gets to block one, if that text, test condition is false now, it will go to block three. And so you get that looping structure. But there's all sorts of ways you could represent that. So for example, when we have the uh, block structure, we can't tell whether it came from a, a while loop or a for loop that's missing an init and update, um, or even some sort of function with a tail call. So all three of those would produce the same block structure. Um, so that's pretty cool. And we can use that to say that this program is like this program, or this program is this program, despite syntactical differences, uh, AST level differences. So some of the neat things that we can do with it, and some of the things that prevent us from doing the neat things, um, just to touch on that. If we can build control flow graphs, and we can do all sorts of neat optimizations. We can do dead code elimination. It's really easy. And in fact, since we're doing that stitching of visiting, we also automatically have to do some. Because we have to insert, uh, for example, uh, unreachable nodes. Um, if you uh, visit a return statement, and then you have to continue past that in the block, then you create a fake unreachable node. And then you can actually just immediately eliminate all the statements after the return statement, which is kind of cool. Um, one of the more performance-oriented things is that uh, you can split polymorphic function calls into multiple mo monomorphic functions. Um, so if there's anybody that's really into like perf stuff and uh, V8, um, uh, this is where you would take it and you would say, OK, I want to look at this function. I want to record all the calls to this function and see that they all have the same hidden class ID. So I'm calling this function with only the same type. Um, and if it's not, we can record all the different calls that it makes, and we can take that function and rewrite all of its calls to call multiple different functions that are all monomorphic. So we can pre-optimize for V8 or spider monkey. I saw your Firefox shirt. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> um, you can use all sorts of extreme minification, too. Like, you can actually notice if a, in a block, a straight line block, um, if there's a load and then you modify a value and you replace the value into the name um, multiple times, you can eliminate all those uh, extraneous storage operations. So you can actually do some uh, pretty extreme uh, minification. And finally, you can generate uh, static single assignment graphs, which is what V8's crankshaft uh, does underneath the covers. And I'll show you like what that looks like. Um, using IR Hydra um, just to get an idea of what that is. OK. We also do some sort of mad science stuff. And this is actually why I originally wanted this, uh, the first point. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm alone in this, but if you've ever had to re re review big pull requests, there's like a huge chunk of code and a huge chunk of code, lots of green and lots of red, it's very hard for me at least, to reason about what's actually changed without reading both and internalizing both versions of the function and then sort of just mentally doing the diff. Like small changes are easy, but big changes are hard. But with a control flow graph, you can actually differentiate like, oh, you changed this function and now there's a new exception edge. Or, oh, you changed this function and now there's a new branch in it. It's very easy to visually tell the difference between two functions this way. Uh, for the security-minded, you can perform uh, taint checking uh, to make sure that uh, user input doesn't make it to dangerous functions. And this is sort of pie in the sky, but if the intermediate representation is uh, advanced enough, you could project JavaScript into other languages. So you could do things like you could notice that the subset of JavaScript that you're writing just naturally falls under the uh, like guidelines of uh, ASM.js, for example, and you could project it into ASM.js or LLJS. Or if you had two IRs that were pretty much compatible, you could say, I can cast it into Python or Ruby or something like that. And that's sort of like down the line. But once we get enough people interested in this topic, that's the sort of thing that we start to enable. But first, when we are talking about building control flow graphs out of JavaScript, we also have to run, take care of these two big problems. The first big problem is that 
JavaScript has a lot of uh, inherited wonky control structures, just bizarre stuff from Java, actually. Um, and the second is that we want to have as many linear blocks as possible to keep a, a simple control flow graph so we can easily uh, process that and make assumptions based on it. So first one, uh, how many people are familiar with uh, labeled break? Show of hands. Wow. Uh, it's the worst thing ever. Um, <laughs> it's the well, second worst thing ever, because I have another thing on another slide that's got that plus another thing. So I guess it is. Uh, the C does it the worst thing ever. Um, for those who haven't seen this before, uh, you can label any block, and uh, you can use break to jump to the end of that block. You don't have to be in a loop. You can just do that. Um, it's basically like uh, having a uh, if statement, uh, an inverted condition on the if statement for the rest of the code past the breakpoint. It's kind of awful. And it's hard to read reason about. And also, continue doesn't work on it. So that's just, who knows why that's there. But when you, it, the real fun comes when you combine it with things like finally, which can accept execution from multiple different edges. And the way you enter that block di actually dictates how you exit that block. For example, if you just run the try part of the code, it will naturally go into the finally and then pass out of the finally block and onto normal execution. But if you go through the finally block by returning or breaking or throwing an exception, it will enter there and the finally block has the last word. So it will either uh, do whatever the exit pr performance was going to be, or if it itself does some other exit performance, it will actually uh, interrupt that. So we, we want to break to B1, there's a finally, it says break B2, so we break to B2. Doesn't matter what uh, happened in the try block. Even if you return, you could actually prevent the return from happening, which is just crazy. Um, and uh, it's in the language, so we had to account for it, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I guess. I mean, obfuscating code is always fun. <laughs> and the second sort of larger problem with control flow graphs in JavaScript is that for a lot of the things that you want to do, you want to have a very linear, simple control flow graph. And a linear block is whenever you can have one operation that goes directly to another operation and it has no ability to transfer control anywhere else. You can take all of those and glom them into one big block. And so when it enters, it must exit. It must exit the one direction. Uh, like, well, it must exit into the next operation. And that if uh, control ever enters the block, all the operations are guaranteed to complete. So that's cool. We can guarantee things about the code, and that's, that's awesome. Um, and here's sort of an example. Uh, you can see that we have four operations, and they must le lead into each other, so we can s combine them into a single block. But anything that conditionally execu executes code is not linear. So any branching, any tests, um, anytime you have a logical expression because of short circuiting, um, and anything that throws an exception. Um, so this is a bit of a pop quiz about JavaScript. What operators in JavaScript are guaranteed to never throw exceptions? I'll also take answers in the form of, uh, uh, how many do you think there are? Uh, people who think there's like three kinds of operators, you can raise your hand. Cool. Two? One? Oh, oh, going up? I was trying to pick the lowest. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> zero? Anybody think zero? OK. Well, there, there is one. There is exactly one. It's <laughs> void. Void is the only thing that will never throw an exception. So um, yay. We can, we can at least assert that. Um, delete can throw an exception if it's used on something that's not deletable uh, in strict mode. In can throw an exception if it's not used on, against an object. Instance of can throw an exception if it's not used against a function. New can throw if it's not against a function. All mathematical operators can throw, which is really fun, because if you strip away uh, the coercion functions from an object uh, by setting its prototype to null, or just you know being a horrible person and deleting them outright, I don't know why you do that, but some people do. People have hobbies. Um, then once you try to add an object to a string, suddenly what you get is an exception. 
because it can't coerce down. And all lookups can throw because all lookups can throw. That's pretty, you know, we don't know if it's undefined or null or uh, even de like defined as something in the scope. So really what we're looking for is combinations of operators and operand types. Like that is what we can make assertions about. Like we know if we have two primitive strings and we add them, we're always going to get a primitive string modulo the computer running out of memory, which we can't really account for. Um, or you could try to write your program using just void, but that's kind of a fool's errand. <laughs> it can generate one value. <laughs> so we have to track values to the program, which is a little bit awkward, because in almost any other uh, language that doesn't have uh, so many kinds of exceptions, you wouldn't have to do this sort of exercise. You would do the exercise of creating the CFG, and then you would create the SSA, the static single assignment, and then you would make assumptions from there. But we don't have that luxury because we need to know the types of the operands, or else every block would throw. There would always be two edges for every block, which is just not useful. So when we track values, uh, how, do we, how do we do that? What do they look like? So values can be the, the basic JavaScript types. You have undefined or null. They're both singleton uh, oddballs. Um, primitives, strings, booleans, or numbers. Objects, which actually represent just the set of properties they have. Um, fun functions, which have code in addition to properties. And then another type that we'll use to sort of bolster this when we can't really tell where something is coming from, called unknown. So unknowns are things that are there in the program and we don't know about them yet. I mean, it's kind of easy to guess. But uh, we want to be able to eventually make assumptions about them. So for instance, if you use something from another script in your code, or something that we don't have in our runtime, because we need to have a runtime now, um, we would mark that unknown. We would treat that value as unknown. So you would uh, try to load it from scope, and you would have to throw an exception edge uh, reference error. And then from that point, we would push a, an unknown value. And then we can actually make assumptions based on how we use those values later on, because in a straight line block of code, not block of control flow graph, if we ever access a property off of it, we can draw the, uh, uh, it's undefined edge. And then we can assume that value is defined, because if it reaches any other uh, line of code in the program, it must not have thrown. So that's kind of cool. And we can do the same thing with functions. We could say, like, did you ever call it? OK, you're calling something that we don't know about. But once you get past that call, we can say that, yeah, it's probably a function, because they made it here. It's not going to suddenly swap out values. Yeah. Um, we track values uh, using a stack. So we're actually going to create a, a runtime stack for ourselves. So every time we uh, load an operation, uh, we uh, will push a value on and load three. Subtract will pop two off and replace it with the combination of the two. So we also have to track how do things get added. Uh, so that's the, the basic working of it. But the values are only kind of half the battle here. We also care about names, and we track those separately from values themselves. Names are variable names and property names. An object is just a collection of names, and a scope is just an object that uh, is automatically assigned to a function. So anytime you look up uh, a property off of scope, or like a, a variable name, you're really looking up uh, a property off of an object that you can't see. It's sort of invisibly made for you. Um, is that enough hand waving for everybody? I <laughs> just, just want to make sure that I'm doing enough hand waving. And then it works. Um, but that's, is that in the spec or is that a simplifying assumption? That it's a somewhat simplifying assumption, but you can actually, for most values of a runtime, you can actually get away with it. Like, uh, scope is actually sort of stripped down. And you can do a sort of optimizations and not use a full scope object and only close over the values that you want, which is things that like V8 does. I'm sure SpiderMonkey does it as well. But for our purposes, we just want less code, so we're going to use objects. Um, but yeah, that is a good point. Um, operations can actually determine whether a name is pushed onto the stack or a value. And you might have seen this before if you like mistype a program in a hurry or under the influence of something. Uh, you might get an invalid L value in assignment. And that means that uh, we couldn't find a name for the left-hand side to actually put into the stack. So 
as an example, uh, we visit each of these. So we visit x first on the left-hand side, and we get it, and we put a name onto the stack. We load the value of x, load 3, merge together, and then we store it back in x. So we had to, when we do a store, it's a combination of a name and a value, and we replace it with the value that was stored in. Phew. And this is, kind of, this is kind of an interesting point about JavaScript, and maybe all garbage collected languages. Values only exist for as long as at least one name points to them. So when we write JavaScript, we're actually given this like sort of a bonsai tree of objects, this graph of objects. And then what we do with names is we use the names to hold on to parts of it, to prune it or to grow it. And that's how, what we're doing. We're uh, manipulating this graph of objects over time which is kind of an interesting concept, I think. Uh, and then you, like, if, unless you're a functional programmer, in which case, that's totally gross and we should never mutate state like that. <laughs> and if we got a bonsai tree like that, we would just literally throw it out the window <laughs> because we could not prove that it was a correct bonsai tree. <laughs> but since we're tracking values, we run into like one uh, sort of arch problem, which is branches. And branches are really fun and they cause me a lot of consternation in thinking about this because what we're actually doing when we're, when we're running these control flow graphs things uh, is that we're actually executing every branch simultaneously and tracking the results. So we're, we're, we've got a runtime that does everything. It doesn't pay attention to actual test results, it, like the test result of an if case. Um, so a value could be x or y depending on the branch taken. How do we represent this? What's x's type? What's y's type? And it sort of depends on when you ask in the program. X is sometimes a number, sometimes a string. Y is sometimes undefined and sometimes a string. And for a while, what I had sort of kind of intended to do, I really hedged my bet on that sentence, was I would get to a branch and I would copy the entire world. And that didn't work so well because you copy the entire world. So you're copying the entire runtime and just being like, okay, now I have two bonsai trees and I have to track both of them. And every time there'd be another branch, we'd just like duplicate another bonsai tree out and just be a uh, horrible uh, shrubbery disaster. Um, so what I came up with, and this might not be the best solution, so if you can think of one, again, I would love to hear from you about this, is I actually inject a proxy into the scope chain, so a fake object. And everything inside the scope chain, uh, everything inside the branch asks for names through it. And when it gets a name through that proxy, those names are wrapped. So whenever you use those values transparently, it just comes out as a normal value. But when you change the, where a name is pointing, it actually, the name does a copy on write. So it actually splits that value pointed at into two things. It gives you back inside the branch one value, and outside the branch you get a new, gets a new either object. And it's kind of similar to uh, if you're in an SSA, something called a phony function or a phi function. Um, which is really fun to say. So what we end up with is after this branch executes is we get a, an either object of a number or a string, which is x. Uh, and y is either an undefined or a string. And then further operations can operate on those and add properties and uh, lookups on them will themselves return either, uh, wrapped either names. It could still be an either value. Um, and that's sort of where I've got, got things going now. And it's sort of demo time now. Well, it's really demo time now. Um, also, congratulations, you just got through 85 slides. <laughs> so, okay. If everything is correct, and everything is correct, yay. Um, I'm in a demos folder, and I've got this uh, project called S Control. Um, and it's up on GitHub, and it's up on NPM, and it's sort of in a, in a kind of temporary state, and I would uh, urge you to not consider as control the thing to go contribute to, but the thing to be thinking about is control flow graphs, and if you have the desire to work within them, either work on this or build your own, it's really fun to do. And you feel free to like crib ideas from it or come in and say that it's just um, horrifying, because parts of it are horrifying. Anyway, so what can we do? We can visualize stuff, and then we'll just start there. Um, so we have, we have an empty file, we have an existing file. So we have our old comparison function. Can everyone see this or is it a little bit hard to read? Because I can do the inversion dance too. Now the yellow is hard to read. Okay. 
Anybody? Everybody good? Cool. So we've got a function uh, that does the comparison, sees if left-hand side is greater than right-hand side, and we compare against math random, and if it's greater than 0.5, then we log hello, otherwise we log hi. Neat. So what we'll do is we'll use graphviz, because graphviz is so great. Yes. <laughs> And we'll give it a type of SVG and we'll put it out to this output SVG. And I'll use control tab to confuse myself for a moment. Okay. All right. Well, all right, actually. So this is our program. You can see that we've linearized all these operations. They all have to happen. And I've made sort of a stylistic decision of when I call functions, I inline them. Um, and be, the reason I do that is that since we are tracking all the values and we know the values that we're putting into the arguments, then uh, technically if you visit the same function with different values, you can create different graphs for the function. So uh, the only way to be sure is uh, to sever the head or whatever, but actually to inline it. Um, sorry for kind of a bad zombie reference. Um, so you can see we go through, we are actually calling into uh, the comparison function. Um, these enter operations are no ops. They're just kind of there for helping us reason about it. We load the left-hand side value. We load the right-hand side value. We subtract them. We have that subtractive value on the stack. We load the literal, and then we do the greater than. We exit, and we uh, put that value out to the test. And this is where things start to get interesting, because we have those two branches. But these purple edges, oh, I should mention really quick. Uh, green means that was true. Control moves this way if it's true. Red means control moves this way if it's false. Purple means control moves this way if there's an error. And it looks like, from the looks of it, we don't know what console.log is. So that sucks. So and we have got all these exceptions. And this is kind of a little taste of what it would look like if we didn't do any value tracking. We would have exceptions everywhere. Um, but we get out, we pop and we go down to the exit if statement and exit program. So if we modify things, and I think I can. So if we actually define console log up there, console is an object with log, which is a function. That way, and we'll refresh. We'll open a new tab, we'll refresh. And suddenly we can linearize this box because we actually know about console log. So we're actually loading console, loading log, loading the literal hello and calling it. And you can see the sort of operations, the sort of kind of IR-ish thing I've chosen here has a load prop name from the thing in the stack and that replaces the uh, value out. And the reason why we're loading a name there instead of uh, an actual value for uh, people that are really into that, uh, is that we want to load the name because the name actually comes with a binding to the last uh, object it was looked up off of. So when we do console.log, we're looking log up off of console and we want to loosely bind it. So when it's, whenever it's called at that point, it's still bound to that context, that this value. Phew. So for a slightly more complicated example, Let's look at Fibonacci because it's JavaScript and uh, what would JavaScript be if it couldn't compute values of Fibonacci very quickly um, and web scale Lee. <laughs> and it looks like this. And I, I use this as an example of back edges. So we're loading the uh, program. You'll recall that we were calling it in a loop and console logging it. So we've actually like, we've got the, we're out loading the value i, we're testing it, um, doing a less than, doing the test. And if it's false, we leave. And that's probably as about as interesting as that branch gets. This branch gets interesting though. We don't know about console or log again. Sorry guys, folks. Um, uh, we load Fibonacci, we load i, and we call it, and we actually enter it, it's inlined. Um, it actually maintains a stack, for better or worse. Um, so it can actually notice that it is being called recursively. So we get down uh, if i is greater than one. If i is not, it goes down that way. Um, but if i is greater than one, we call itself again, and this creates a back edge up to the actual function call up here. And we actually do it twice because Fibonacci. 
um, or Fibonacci, sorry. Um, so you can see we, do, we have two back edges up. And then uh, once we go to the end, we add them, we get function declaration, we actually call, we pop off that console thing that was on our stack for forever. Um, and what a relief. <laughs> um, it was so heavy, I guess, to hold. Um, and we go at, into the uh, for loop, the, the post, the update part with the post increment and pop it, and this back edge back up. So that's pretty cool. You can sort of visualize these things and like if you can imagine taking a diff of uh, somebody putting code into your program or submitting a PR to your uh, program and diffing the actual like graphs here. That, I would find that helpful. Hopefully others do too. <laughs> If they inverted one of the tests, would your diffing algorithm be able to be like, yeah, this is still the same? It's just, uh, it would really be like, whoa, those are huge changes. Since the actual graphing is done by dot, it's kind of up to dot and how it would oh, arrange so you're it. Oh, so about diffing the actual yeah. output. Yeah, you could actually do a diff of the output. Or you could actually, if you wanted to run a diff algorithm against that, uh, that would be super cool. Um, and write that. I right, thought you had a particular one in mind that you were talking about. Oh, no. Not yet. Um, Okay. So you might wonder how much it can handle in terms of uh, how slow is it how, versus how big of the program is. Um, I'll just. How does it get to itself? <laughs> oh, fun fact. Uh, recursion is really fun when you're inlining the function call because for a while I didn't do the check that it's up, like should put a back edge. I ran it against jQuery and jQuery recursively does something. Uh, for its copy operation, and it's like, it's taking forever. It's running the program. <laughs> so, halting problem. Um, okay, so this is a, a, an implementation of inflate uh, that is about 810 lines long um, in JavaScript. And we've got some, like, I, I added these sort of fakey using it examples. Uh, they're wrong, they would crash the program, but you know, at least. Uh, runs. That's one downside of the existing thing is that you have to, it only analyzes code that runs versus code that doesn't. So you have to sort of modify for that. And again, this is a good place that if you want to build something like this and make it do something different, there are lots of stylistic choices to be made and lots of different results. So we'll give it to subject three. Um, and refresh it. And it's huge. Turns out, uh, lots of linearizable operations, and it goes down and down and down. Uh, the first thing it doesn't know about is the UN8 array, and then it's down and down and down and down and down and down. It's actually not that big because it doesn't get that far, because um, you have to keep feeding inflate data. It gets as far basically as the headers of inflate, but still, it's kind of fun to see. So the next demo, really quick. The other thing you can do with it. Get this up. Let's hear it for screen. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> uh, so we have a function adder that is a higher order function. It returns a function that takes a value and it adds them. And uh, we have two values at global scope: uh, my adder, and then we have another value. And what we can do, since we're type, like tracking everything, we get the final values of everything. Uh, we can actually do. Uh, Sorry for the verbal stack, by the way. Something like this, and we'll actually get the types of the things. And you'll see some of the runtime stuff, but down here, uh, where it's kind of hard to see, let's move that over a bit. You'll have things like uh, my adder is a function with a prototype that whose signature is, it takes a this of global, a value which is a number, and returns a number. So that's our like inner function that we've gotten. The actual adder uh, takes a number, Global, and returns a function with prototype, which is my error. And then the value we actually get at the end of it is a number. So that's kind of cool. We can statically say that. What happens if we put a string into it, uh, into the adder? It actually changes the types. So uh, the value will always be a string. We'll put a number into the my adder, but we'll always get a string. And the adder itself is um, from string to function prototype. And you can actually have two instances, so it's not it's not going to uh, break too badly. Well, it will if you don't give it the right program. 
Um, but it, it can actually track the two separate. It doesn't actually record them. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, it'll, it'll combine some values because it uh, d uses another trick from V8 called shared function info. So it implements that because why not? And for the last demo, well, if, unless you're interested in I or Hydra and some stuff like that, um, there's taint checking, which is finding uh, user input where it shouldn't be. So we have uh, our server, and you'll know, remember that uh, you have to execute whatever code you want it to actually visit. So you might think to yourself, like, are we actually implementing all of Node? No, uh, we're not going to do that. That's like sort of boiling the ocean a bit. But we have this thing. We have rec.url, which is coming from a user, and we can do all sorts of horrible xsse -E things. And then we have the sanitize function, where we're waving our hands and saying that we're mutating it and cleaning it up and removing all the HTML, and things are better. Things are better when you run that. So I'll show you. I don't think I ever showed you the test functions, so I apologize for that. But here's what sControl looks like. You grab S control, you grab a Sprema, and you grab the file system. You read uh, some JavaScript, you parse it into an AST, and you hand it to S control. And S control gives you back this tiny little stub of a control flow graph. And it's not done yet. It actually hasn't even parsed anything. It hands you the ability to sort of uh, uh, turn that organ grinder um, and make it dance. So what we've given it, it also has hooks for when it visits things. So when it visits a function expression, it has on function. And when it visits a, a call operation, it has on call. And the result is on call, and it gives you the result and the function that generated the result. On operation is when any sort of operation happens. So you can hook into this and kind of play with your own JavaScript runtime. So what we want to do is we want to grab uh, the sanitize value, the, the sanitize function, and the handler function. So we have those as null. We have this on function hook. And so every time it gets called, it gets called as a value in a node. And if the node's name is handler, we grab it. Or the, name, the node's name is sanitize, and we grab it. And then that's as far as we get, because it doesn't execute anything else. Well, we have the control flow graph in a, in a stopped state. And now we can start doing things and making it do things. So we create a control flow graph. Uh, the control flow graph creates an object for us, an object in our runtime for the request and the response and the URL. And we can create a function that can call that when we uh, you know, turn that organ grinder handle, it will call back into our runtime JavaScript. So we can actually implement runtime functions here. Um, so what we do is we have this write function that if it ever gets called, and if we get the mark on any of the arguments and it says it's tainted, then we throw an exception. We throw an assertion error. And we push a value back on because it's a JavaScript function, and you're in a runtime, so you meet, need to make sure that like the value stack is populated correctly. Like I said, it's a little rough. You can see that um, this isn't just um, sort of jQuery's uh, literate programming. Not literate programming. I'm using that word wrong. Uh, it's not just chained operations here. It's actually creating name objects that we're assigning to, and we just don't care to keep them around. Um, so. It, Fluent program. Thank you. Um, so we get the URL back, and we set a mark on it that says tainted is true. And we call it. We actually do on line 34 the handler value call. Call the control flow graph. Call it with the control flow graphs global, the request and the response objects. Um, and it's not a new operation. And then we turn the organ grinder handle. And the control flow graph dances and weaves us an uh, interesting yarn. And you'll note that when we created the control flow graph, we, created, we added two other listeners, on called and on operation. So on called is where we check to see if something is the sanitized value. And if it's the sanitized value, we pop that value out and replace it with one that's not marked tainted. So we can actually remove uh, marks from the program. And on operation does. Uh, Whenever you add or subtract or do some sort of unary or binary operation on a value or two values, uh, we'll say is either the marked uh, with tainted. If it's tainted, then we'll set mark tainted true, and that new object will be tainted. Phew. So we'll run it on the subject, and it's tainted. So uh, wait.
Hmm. Oh, yeah. This is one that I actually hard coded, so bear with me here. I apologize. So, value is tainted. It can tell. Joy of joys. But if we call, we can even try to confuse it a little bit. We can do like XS rec URL plus, hey guys. <laughs> and it's still tainted. But if we ever do sanitize on it, it'll pass. So we can do some level of taint checking. And this is still in the early stages. Like I coded out the uh, uh, setting marks and stuff last week on Saturday night. So it's not, it's not super production ready, but it shows where you could go with it. If you have some branch and or no, I'll just say, if you overwrite X's after it gets tainted with something else, it's the value that's tainted, not the name, right? Yep. So if you conditionally overwrite it and both branches end up overwriting it, can that's, you tell that it's not tainted? That's where there's a bug right now. Okay. I, would, I need to propagate the, the marks into the either object. Okay. Um, and it's kind of partially there right now. Um, so it works for some cases, but in some cases it does some really funky stuff. So. Uh, Either is, either is a fun abstraction, but it's also really painful because you end up with nested ethers, mm -hmm. since there's two types. Mm -hmm. um, is your ether associative and commutative? Or is it just like a tree? It's just a tree. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for what it's worth, just a tree just does that. Um, the bonus is Ira Hydra. If you're interested in it, I can show you what an SSA looks like really quick. And then we can do questions. Um, this is sort of unrelated, but it's a nice example of like, okay, this is sort of the end thing that you can use control flow grass for. So, because it's really fun to remember all the flags that you had to like pour into Node, I've got a handy little run me file. So, we'll run it. And what this is, uh, what program this is, is a base64 decoder that I writ wrote um, for funsies. Um, and it does a lot of inlining stuff, and actually, uh, uh, there's a better one. The B64 module is much better because it actually partially unrolls the loop, so use that instead. It's basically so you don't have to do a buffer copy ever, um, but that's sort of besides the point. Oh, it helps to, sorry, hmm. There we go. That's much better. Um, helps to be running the, the right thing. So this is Ayer Hydra. Um, this is by Mr. Aleph, um, who is a self-described crazy Russian compiler engineer. Um, and he does great work. So we'll gra grab the hydrogen file, which is the IR that um, V8 uses internally, and the code.asm, which is uh, the assembly turns out, uh, and we'll feed it to IR Hydra. One interesting note that is kind of, I had a misconception about it, um, so I'm just going to share it in the interest of uh, full disclosure. Uh, there's never a function in JavaScript that isn't compiled to assembly of some sort. So it's always an assembly. It's just a question of whether it calls back into C++ very often. Um, and crankshafted code uh, will not call back in that often. So. Uh, that, that's a point to take into account in a second when I show you what it looks like. So that's it has. That's V8 you're talking about. That's in V8. Okay. So we go to the decode, decoder decode. They can see the graph. So we can actually see, okay, um, it's really uh, fun. So it's got the block, that sort of control flow block thing, but it's actually doing a static single assignment. And the sort of colors you see, the, the sort of pinkish down there means it's a, a, a nested loop. It's not, it's not like, it's, it's bad code, it's really red. Um, it's red because it's nested, so that's not a problem. Um, that B1 block has got a red dashed line because there are problems with it, technically, because it contains operations, this load name generic, this changes, this actually calls into uh, C++, plus, yeah, sorry, C++ or JavaScript. Or it calls into C++ and then hops over to a native JavaScript uh, function for loading the name generic. 
And if you look inside of uh, the V8 source code, there's a runtime.js that actually contains a lot of JavaScript functions that are performed when you're actually doing just writing your normal JavaScript. So a lot of V8 is actually already in JavaScript. So you can kind of see that. It's, what's interesting here is that the original loop uh, did, wasn't this complex. What's really happened here is that we've inlined this structure a couple times. So, and that's that's a sort of a safe assumption. You can make safe assumptions when you have this SSA. Um, to give you an idea of what the difference is, is that you'll notice that there's not really any any names so much, and especially. Let's see if we can get to a phi. Yeah, phi functions. Phi functions are great. Um, again, uh, what it does, what a phi function is, is um, in. Uh, in an SSA, you can only have uh, one assignment to a variable at a time. So what happens is every time you assign to a variable like x, if you have x equals 1, x equals 2, you really have uh, new new variables called x sub 0, x sub 1. And what happens with that is when you enter a, a branching thing, you get x sub 1 on the one side and x sub 2 on the other side, and you come together and you want to pick a new x value. So you do x sub 3 equals the phi function. And what this can be implemented as when you're actually compiling stuff is you just leave the values on the registers that you've allocated. So um, that's probably not super useful information, but if you're writing a compiler, then that's what it is. Um, but the, this is sort of down the line of what you could do with this. You can actually um, uh, build out an SSA from JavaScript. So with that, uh, are there any questions? Um, anyone want to see anything else? Uh, Thanks for listening.